So I hope you do have a Bible so that you can see that scripture and others as well. You tickle me, Pastor James. Well, we're going to finish up the book of Habakkuk this morning. This is the final message uh, in this series. Um, you know, as, as the case usually is, the, the teacher, the preacher, probably gains more, learns more in the preparation and so forth. And um, I don't know about you, but uh, it, it's been a, um, a wonderful journey for me in going through this. It's, it's the very first time that I've ever uh, preached through the book of Habakkuk. I'm, I'm sorry to admit that to you, but it's, it's kind of interesting in the 40 plus years that I've preached that I haven't preached all the way through that book. I don't know if in my older age I'm getting more daring at the challenges in front of me. I have to tell you that there are times where that um, when I set out on a series and I start preparing for it, sometimes I go, what was I thinking in doing that? You know, uh, but it's always rewarding to go through the Word of God and to look at the Word of God and to study the Word of God. Now, most of us are going to... Um, Give thanks this week. You know, we're going we're gonna to have our, our Thanksgiving celebration somewhere, somehow. We, we are going to celebrate Thanksgiving. Uh, thinking about that, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I was on the Internet, Pastor James, and uh, I went to YouTube, and I found that there's a sports commentator that is predicting that the people of Dallas are going to get an early Christmas present. Did you hear about this? Yeah. A national sports commentator. He is predicting that the Cowboys are going to get an early Christmas present, that the Cowboys are going to win against the Patriots this afternoon. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> you talk about being able to be thankful. Wow. You know, most of us find it easy to give thanks when everything goes right. The truth of the matter is, whether the Cowboys win or not this afternoon, even if you're a diehard Cowboys fan, we still ought to give thanks, right? And so, um, you know, I recently read of a man who had really bad timing in giving thanks. You know, somebody has said timing is everything. And, and this man was, uh, the story begins that he was out in the desert and for days he's crawling across the desert. He's trying to find his, his way of uh, civilization, some sort of semblance of uh, comfort and all of that. And, and he finally makes his way through the desert, and lo and behold, he comes upon this house that's there, and there's a preacher that has, has a house out at the edge of the desert. Well, this man is weak, and he's tired, and he crawls up to the house, and he collapses on the doorstep. And so the preacher revives him and gets him to the point that he comes, comes back, and he's beginning to, to gain his strength and that. And um, so feeling better, the man asks the preacher for directions to the town. And the preacher says, well, yeah, I can give you directions, but I'm going to do better than that. I, I'm going to give you my horse so that you don't have to walk uh, your way to that town. You could take this horse and make it there. And he said, but there's one special thing about this horse that you need to be aware of. You have to get the horse to go. You have to say, thank God. And if you want the horse to go faster, you got to go, thank God, thank God. And if you want the horse to really go thanks, you got to go, go faster. you got to go, thank God, thank God, thank God. And he said, and the other thing you need to remember is to get it to stop, you have to say amen. So the man's very thankful, and he's anxious to get to town. You know, he, he, he gets on the horse, and he says, thank God. And the horse just starts walking, you know. And he says, thank God, thank God. The horse picks up his speed a little bit faster. And he goes, thank God, thank God, thank God. And so the horse is just really going along at a clip. And he's really at a, a, a full run. And then he realizes, as he's running for quite a while, that up ahead there's a cliff that he's headed to. And he's going, whoa, whoa, whoa. And the horse won't stop. And he's, he's trying to get it to slow down. And, and so all of a sudden he, re he realizes, oh, it's not whoa, it's not hold, it's amen. And so he says, amen, and the horse stops. And the man looks, leans forward in the saddle, 
and sees that the cliff is just right there. And in his exuberance, he says, oh, thank God. <laughs> well, except for a case like that, I, I, I want to tell you there's, there's never a bad time to thank God. There's never a bad time. And so um, giving thanks is always appropriate, the appropriate thing to do. So if you have your Bibles, go with me to Habakkuk chapter 3. And uh, we're going to look at some scripture there. We're specifically going to look at the, uh, towards the end of the chapter there, verses 16, uh, all the way to the end. And, um, uh, you know, the... Well, I'll, I'll set the scenario after we read the scripture together. So follow along with me if you own a Bible, as Pastor James says. If you don't own a Bible, you can look up here. And by the way, if you don't own a Bible, we have one for you. We will make sure that you have a Bible. Um, so Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones, and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet... Oh, say that word with me, please. Yet, come on, say it better. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word today. And thank you, Lord, uh, for the time of worship and for, Lord, just encouraging us. And, Lord, for the body of Christ that is here today, Lord, to celebrate your goodness and your grace and, and to encourage one another. I thank you, Lord, for the anointing of the Lord that is in this place today. Upon me, O oh God, to declare, Lord, the word of God, speak to each of us here today, O oh God. May you transform us, O oh God, not just for our sake, but for the kingdom's sake, we pray. And everyone said, I want you to see, first of all, that Habakkuk teaches us that we can give thanks in dark days if we decide to. Praise God regardless of our circumstances. Uh, let, me, let me say that again. I know it's up there. I, I, I want it to just sink into my heart and to yours. We can, we, we can give thanks to God even in dark days if we decide to give thanks to God regardless of our circumstances. Now, the external circumstances here are reflected in verse 16. And really verse 16 is there because of everything in chapter 1 and chapter 2. Because as you recall in chapter 1, Habakkuk is lamenting over the fact that wickedness is prospering. And that there's so much injustice that is taking place. And he's lamenting to God. And God says, okay, hang on a minute. It seems that way. But just watch. Watch what I'm about to do. You're going to be shocked. You're going to be surprised. And indeed, Habakkuk was shocked and surprised in chapter 2 when God's answer was he was going to use a, a, a wicked nation to come and bring judgments against the wickedness in his nation. And Habakkuk was like, Lord, Lord how can that be? And that's our memory verse. You know, how can it be that your eyes are too pure to look upon evil? And so he's lamented over that, and, and God tells Habakkuk, watch what he is going to do, and tells him that the Babylonians, a cruel, ruthless people, are coming to bring judgment and captivity to the people of Israel. So then Habakkuk starts to focus on the eternal, not the the. the external circumstances. And that's my problem and your problem at times. We tend to focus on what's going on in the moment around us 
instead of thinking about big picture. And, and when he begins to think about what's going on around him, he writes verse 16 that we just read. When I heard it, my stomach, I, I'm going to read it from, the, we just read it from the New International. Listen to it from the message. It says, when I heard it, my stomach did flips. I stammered and stuttered. My bones turned to water. I staggered and I stumbled. Have you ever been there? Yeah, sure you have. You, you've probably been there when at some time or another maybe you lost your income. Or, or when you lost someone very close to you. When there's this incredible loss and, and, and you faced uncertainty uh, uh, that, that was all before you. It, when you look at the external circumstances, your knees begin to buckle and your stomach begins to do flips and you wonder, how am I going to make it? What am I going to do when you look at the external circumstances? The odds are that if you've not faced that, at some time in your lifetime, you will. The external circumstances, they shake us. They make us quake. Habakkuk says when looking at the conditions around him, he's looking at the fact that the Babylonians are going to come and the blooms on the fig tree and the grapevines which, you know, you can do a lot of analogies over this, but blossoms speak about future harvest, don't they? You know, have you ever planted a garden? And uh, you, you, when you plant a garden, if, you know, as a kid, I used to love to, to plant the garden in the backyard in northeastern Ohio and watch the, the seedlings come up and then, then watch the tomato plants have blooms on them or, or, or watch, you know, the, the green beans or, or the cucumbers or, or the pumpkins or, or the watermelons. In because when the bloom came, it spoke of the future fruit. But here there are no blossoms, so the future looks really bleak. And then he says something about he's shaken because the olive crops and the fields are in that condition, and, and it speaks of the present. You know, the, the olives are going to fail, and the fields are going to... There's, there's, there's plants there, but they are failing, and there's going to be no harvest in the present. And then the sheep and the cattle and the stalls, it can speak of the, of the past because, you know, they're, they're empty and there's no livestock. Now, notice the decision that Habakkuk makes in those dark days. It is a clear decision for he says in verse 18, yet, you said that with me, right? Let's say that again. Yet, yet I will rejoice in the Lord I will be joyful in God my Savior. Make no mistake, thanksgiving is a decision. And it is a decision, according to the Word of God, that is not to be predicated upon the external circumstances of my life. Habakkuk decided, he chose regardless to rejoice, regardless of the external circumstances, regardless of the future being bleak, no blooms, regardless of crop failure, regardless of pens and stalls being empty, a bank account having nothing in it. He chose to rejoice in the Lord. Now, one commentator says in notes of this, it is right and proper to voice appreciation or thanks for God, to God for his goodness when he bestows it and gives us the necessities of life, health and prosperity and those things. But when these things are lacking, catch this, to rejoice or to give thanks in God for his own sake is evidence of pure unadulterated faith. That's the kind of people we're instructed to be. You see, Habakkuk chose to thank God even in desperate 
dire, dark days. And he did this long before Paul would write to the New Testament church, to the church at Thessalonica, and to the church at Abundant Life in Grand Prairie, Texas, to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ around the world, Paul would write under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. I wonder if Paul might have even looked back at Habakkuk the prophet and saw that and said, oh, yes, this is the will of God. Though the blossoms fail, though the crops fail, though the stall is empty. As I leave this first point, I want to ask myself and ask you, do you give thanks in all circumstances? even in the dark days. Now, the second thing that Habakkuk teaches us and how to give thanks in the dark days is that we must decide to recognize the true source of our strength. Look at Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 19. He says, you know, he's going to rejoice in the sovereign Lord is my strength He makes my feet like the feet of a deer, and he enables me to tread on the heights. So Habakkuk shifts his view from the blossoms, from the crops, from the stall being empty, and he shifts it into rejoicing in the the internal circumstances, and he recognizes that his strength is not in those things, but his strength is in the sovereign Lord. He took his view off of his own strength and by extension off of his own weaknesses and saw that he could depend on God's strength. Uh, we, I, I just love the chorus that we sang this morning, and it sounded like you did too. What a mighty God. What a mighty God. What a mighty God you are. And mighty speaks of strength. I'm not strong. He is. I have limitations and weaknesses. He doesn't. And so I can rejoice in dark days when I recognize my strength is not my it, it, dependent upon who I am, but upon who he is. A little boy was helping his father clear a lot. I, I really like this illustration because... I have so many memories of working with my dad in a tree service and clearing brush and going into a, 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 the woods in northern Ohio and cutting up the tree branches and tops that were left from logging out all of that stuff. And so, uh, you know, worked with my dad quite a bit. As a, one, as a matter at one point, one of my dad's co-workers at General Motors uh, once said to my father, Uh, John, you better be careful. People are going to call the children's services on you because you're breaking child labor laws the way you work those kids. But I look back on it, and it's just an awesome time with them and clearing a lot. And So it made me think about this, that this, this young boy was helping his father, and he was trying to work very hard but failing to lift some of the big logs and things that were there. And, and the father heard the little boy grunting and groaning as he's trying to remove this big log. And so he says to him, he says, are you using all your strength? The little boy said, yes, sir. And the father looked back at him and said, no, you're not. And the little boy stopped and looked at him. And he said, the reason why you're not using all your strength is you have not asked me to help. If you're in a dark day and there's a, a log, a, a, a blossom that has failed, if there's crop failure in some point in your life or, or, or there's no, no resources, finances to draw on. You know, God is asking us today, are you using all your strength, especially if we're here, his, his children, and if we say, yes, we are, he might say to you today, no, you're not. You haven't asked me to help. 
Oh. So I, I want you to see that it's his strength that we can draw on in dark days. His strength, Habakkuk tells us, enables us to tread upon the heights. Now, in, in our day, walking on the high places could, could bring to mind recreational activities. You know, as you read this, walking on the heights, you might, you might think about, um, you know, mountain climbing. Go out on a beautiful day, go over to, to uh, Cedar Hill. And isn't Cedar Hill the highest place in, in North Texas? So that's a height to us. It really isn't a mountain, but I mean, it's Cedar Hill, and so we can look all across it. You know, I, I, I've come down that Lake Ridge Parkway, and as you're coming down Lake Ridge Parkway out of Cedar Hill, you can see AT&T Stadium. You can see all the way out across there and all that. But, but the whole point here that I want to make to you is back when this was written, it wasn't written about exercise and getting out into nature. These are all 21st century ideas. In Habakkuk's day, no one exercised for the sake of exercise. You know why? They didn't have to. That's right. I mean, the, it was all manual labor. And so what was happening here is, in this culture, high places connotes a difficulty, a challenging place, a place one would not want to go unless it was absolutely necessary. You might climb to a high place to gain an indefensible ground in a, in a great battle, but you would only go there if you couldn't avoid it. So high places here really meant a difficulty that the sovereign Lord is my strength. He enables my feet to tread upon the difficulties, the dark days, if you will. Habakkuk's not talking about a pleasurable afternoon hiking. He dreads what God has had in store. We find that very clear in verse 16, don't we? He knows the path ahead is very challenging and very difficult. So why rejoice? Because God is good. Yeah, all the time, and all the time, God is good. God is wise. God is in control, and he knows just what he is doing. Now, not only is he able to me to help me in the dark days to climb through and over these difficulties, Habakkuk also said, his strength makes me sure-footed. Now, I... I submit to you, had Habakkuk lived in our day and time and lived on this continent, he probably would have said, he gives me feet like the big horn sheep. Take a look at this picture with me, please. He gives me feet like the big horn sheep. Um, you know, how many have ever seen one of these out in the wild? Let me see your hand. You've seen one of these out in the wild. Some folks have been to some of those areas. Amazing, isn't it? A few decades ago, Elk and I had the opportunity, it was actually in the fall of the year, it was in August, that um, Elka's brother Peter and his wife Jennifer and Elk and I, this was prior to kids. We all, we, we decided that we were going to go to Anchorage, Alaska, visit Elka's aunt, Anne, who was only three months different than Elka, and so was kind of like a sister instead of an aunt. And uh, we flew up to Anchorage, Alaska, and why we were there, you know, there were several things that we did and we wanted to see and, and all of that. And the guys decided the one thing that we wanted to do was go salmon fishing. Woo! Man, it was a trip. I mean that literally and figuratively. Incredible. We decided that the place we were going to fish was at the, the, the confluence, the place where the Russian and the Kenai rivers come together, the Kenai Peninsula, because that was to be a, a great spot. And, and the king salmon had already run, and king salmon, the reason why they're called king is they're massive. I saw on the bottom of the river there were king salmon down there that looked like they were 80 to 100 pounds. They were as big as me laying in the bottom of that river. But we were fishing for reds, 
for the red salmon, but I digress. Uh, on our way out there, it was quite a trip from to go from Anchorage all the way to that Kenai Peninsula. And as we're driving along, we had to stop for fuel on, on several occasions. And the mountains that loomed out in the distance, they were, man, you just, you looked up to them and you saw those snow-covered peaks and you saw how rugged and how jagged they were. And, and, and they just loomed on the horizon and took everything that, as you looked from the right to the left, they filled the expanse of your vision. Well, we stopped at this gas station as we're refueling, and they had those pay binoculars. Anybody ever remember them? You know, where you put the quarter in them, you know, and you look through them and that. And I thought, well, I, I want to see those mountains up close. And so I started dropping my quarters into it, you know, and, and dropping my quarters into it and dropping my quarters into it. And I'm looking at those mountains, and all of a sudden, I realize there are these big horned sheep. And I see them like that picture was there out on the edge. And, and, and I mean, they are, uh, it was like, how did they get there? And how will they get down from there? They, they just go over that difficulty like it's nothing. They would climb over the uppermost crags and run over rock fields as easily as we would run over the open fields of Grand Prairie. They were nothing for them. Why are they able to do this? Because of their feet. Their tough cloven hooves the style of their hoof, that it is able to conform to whatever crag it was moving towards. These hooves are not hurt by sharp rocks, but are able to grip even the smallest of outcropping. They don't slip, they don't fall. The point here is this, that Habakkuk is uh, pointing out it is not the power of the sheep, but it is the power of the design of the hoof of that sheep. I want to tell you that God wants to give you and I the ability when we call on his strength to let us know that he is so sovereign and so powerful that even when we think that we can't do it, by his strength we are able to do all. So Habakkuk rejoices in the dark days that his feet are made like, like a deer's feet, like a bighorn sheep's feet. Designed by God, helped by God, empowered by God to go over the most difficult of circumstances in life. Our journey is like Habakkuk's. We have questions. We have nagging doubts. We see through a glass darkly and we don't understand why the blossom has failed and why the crops and the olive trees are, are failing to produce their fruit and while this, why the stall is empty. And, and on top of that, we like Habakkuk, when God is silent, we wonder if God cares. We wonder about the injustices that we see. And yet, Habakkuk shows us that in the midst of all of this, he discovered that it is a part of faith's journey, and faith embraces it because the just shall live by I'm thinking this morning and closing about that little band of people who crossed the Atlantic in a boat. Can you imagine this? Crossing the Atlantic in a boat that was 26 feet by 112 feet and landed on the New England coast during a bitter cold winter. At times that first year, the daily ration who those who would make it was only five grains of corn. 
Think about that daily ration. Only five kernels of corn. In early New England, it was a custom at Thanksgiving to place the five kernels at every plate thereafter as a reminder of the dark days of the first winter when the food of the pilgrims was depleted to only a ration of five kernels of corn for each person. So the, the pilgrim fathers wanted their children to remember the sacrifices, the sufferings, the hardships, the dark days. A fitting hardship that was made possible by the, a settlement of a free people in a free land. They wanted to keep alive that memory of the 63-day trip taken on the Mayflower. 63. They decided to keep it alive, the thought and the inhospitable in, in, in coast that they settled on. They didn't want their descendants to forget that on that day in which their rations were reduced to five kernels, only seven healthy colonists remained to nurse the sick, and that nearly half of their members lay in the graveyard windswept just outside the city. They worked seven years to repay London for their loan for their trip. It was before the days of credit cards, obviously. And after suffering every kind of hardship, they had a harvest of 21 acres of corn in the fall of 1621. They immediately offered thanks to God for his blessing. A little group led by Governor William Bradford marched triumphantly through the cornfield singing, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and everything that dwelleth therein. And they sat down and thanked God. They were giving thanks no matter what, even in dark days. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the truth of your word. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. For just focusing on the external circumstances around us. So, God, to be a people that in everything we give thanks. May we thank you, oh God, not only in the blessing, but in the times where we wonder where the blessing is. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand together with me, please, and every head bowed and every eye closed.